Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel and if you're new here, I am Mariana and I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to the channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up and share with our friends. Today, our guest is John Weinberg and he is going to talk about lateral shifts. John has been a PT since 1994 is a McKenzie diplomat and part of the McKenzie faculty since 2008. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, John. Welcome to Pretty People Talk. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So let's jump right in. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, your background. All right. Well, um, I started off, as you can hear, I'm British. Um, I started off um, in the UK um, doing physiotherapy school. I actually started off in Israel. Then I moved to the UK uh, to complete my physical therapy training um, at, at the UEL. Um, after that, a couple of years afterwards, I, I did. Uh, I actually worked in neuro for, um, after uh, during doing my rotations, and then I decided to shoot over to the states for a little while uh, for a couple of years. And when I was over in the states, uh, one of the things I realised um, when I, I was starting to work in outpatients. And the problem I started to have was I couldn't fix anything. I couldn't understand what I was looking at. And when patients got better, I didn't know if they got better because of me or in spite of me. And it got frustrating to the point that I had decided I was going to stop being a physiotherapist and go off to medical school. I thought, well, I'd rather be an orthopedist because I think I'm a good mechanic, but I didn't understand the mechanics sufficiently to be able to be a useful mechanic, you know? Um, I did a lot of manual therapy. That's how I was trained. That's how we're trained in Europe. Probably the same in Brazil, right? You're from Brazil? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I went down those algorithms. Uh, and I think there are people who are probably very, very skilled manual therapists who are highly effective. I just wasn't one of them. And so I didn't know, you know, and so it became frustrating to me because I didn't do this and go through all of this training to then become a technician. I wanted to be a diagnostician. And so um, I was kind of forced to go to my first McKenzie course. Um, the company at the time I was working for kind of demanded it. And so I was like, well, what the hell? I'm going to be leaving uh, physiotherapy anyway. It might be an interesting course. <laughs> and uh, my first instructor was a lady by the name of Elaine Gilman. And I'm happy to put her name up here because, I mean, she really turned me on to McKenzie. And probably with it, there were, there were so many pieces missing for me. When, when I went to that course, um, uh, and like everybody else, I hated treating spines because I didn't know what to do for them. Um, and within the first, uh, now Elaine Gilman's an English instructor. She, I don't think she's still teaching, but Elaine did Mackenzie with Mackenzie, Maitland with Maitland, um, and Syriax with Syriax. So she was, and she was very, very sharp. And within the first 10 minutes of listening to Elaine, I mean, all of these things started to fall into place. Um, and um, I think on the last day of that course, Elaine took me out, drank all my beer and said to me, um, you know, for one month, I want you to go back to your clinic and don't do anything other than Mackenzie. Try to keep your hands off the patient and just see how you do. And I mean, and from that moment, there was truly no looking back. I mean, things that was were, were that were so confusing to me became really, really clear. And and um, and the class and Mackenzie's classification system just helped me not only understand what I could treat, but even more importantly, what I couldn't treat. So why bother beating your head against the wall against trying to treat the things you can't treat? And of course. Is also dangerous to try and treat the things you can't treat because if you're not knowing what you're seeing there, if you can't classify it and it's not an obvious other, then maybe there's something, there's a red flag going on and they need further attention. So that's sort of me. Uh, after that, I opened my own practice um, and I've been in practice now. I've been at a big practice, gone back to a little practice, and I've been in practice now um, since my private practice started, I think, in um, 2000. Um, and now um, I sort of migrate it. Uh, I see um, regular patients in my clinic, and then a couple of days a week I work at University of North Carolina, and I work for the National Football League, um, treating patients for the National Football League. They fly them into me to see them, 
and then I'm working on some stuff now with the University of North Carolina trying to make the treatment for their um, athletes more effective. Okay, that's very cool. Um, and I know we talked a little bit before and you told me that you see a lot of lateral shifts. So that's really interesting that you see that many. So tell us a little bit about that. How, why do you see that many? How, how does it work? Because I feel it's the, a topic that the therapists are not so used to seeing because we don't see that many usually. But just tell us a little bit about your experience. Well, look, the first thing I'm going to suggest to everybody is that they take, that when you have a patient, take the patients, either the male take the shirt off If they're female, recommend they come in a sports bra. Because I guarantee you, there are a lot of patients out there who have a lateral shift and you're just missing them. Uh, or, and people are missing them. Those really, you know, it may not be the hugest lateral shift, but remember, uh, on the courses, we're teaching people, you know, if you have to look at it for more than four seconds, it's not a lateral shift. Now, you pull somebody's shirt up, all of a sudden you're going, oh, look at that. Now, the reason I see so many, I know there's the, the people have asked me, how, how is it possible that you see 150, 200 shifts a year? Well, the reason is, is because in my area, all of the big clinic, all of the clinics have really been bought out either by the big corporate entities or the universities. And, and essentially, every simple derangement or the majority of the simple derangements stay within those companies. The only thing they're allowed to refer out are the patients that other therapists are having a hard time fixing. Or the other ones are the patients who have been to therapy and they hear about me and then they refer themselves over. So the majority of the time, in fact, there's one doctor who knows how to identify a lateral shift. And if his name is on the referral, I, I know before they walk in that they're probably laterally shifted. And it's always amusing to say to a patient, are you crooked? And then they start looking over their shoulders going, who told you? I mean, you know. <laughs> So I, do, I, I just, cool. just see a lot of them, and it's a, a, a and actually they're incredibly rewarding and easy patients to fix. Okay, we think that they're usually hard because I don't feel like, at least I don't feel like I saw that many, so I don't have enough experience to say it. So how do you assess them, and and what do you do usually? What is the rationale? Well, I mean, the same thing, look, if somebody's got a, so I know we're not really supposed to use a pathoanatomical model anymore. Um, so the way I try and explain it to a patient or to other therapists is, you know, because I love Mackenzie's conceptual model. Mackenzie openly said, I don't know if it's a dish, but it seems like a reasonable explanation until there's a better one. And obviously we don't know that everything comes from the disc. It, you can have a disturbance in a facet joint. You could have a disturbance in many kinds of tissue in the spine. There are all sorts of bits down there. So what I try and do is just use McKenzie's conceptual model, except this time, instead of saying this, I say, hey, you've got a balloon. Okay, the balloon is sealed. It's full of toothpaste. But Nick bogged up, said that the consistency of the nucleus of the disc is toothpaste-like. So I feel comfortable saying you've got a balloon and it's full of toothpaste. I squeeze the front of the balloon, the toothpaste moves to the back. I squeeze the back of the balloon, the toothpaste moves to the front. I squeeze the front right side, it goes to the back left. I squeeze the front left side, it goes to the back right. And then I look at a patient, I say, look at you. And, uh, and honestly, um, we I always take pictures of the patients with their permission, often using their own camera, so they can see the shift. Okay, so it's blatant. Then I say to them, okay, so in your case, the toothpaste is accumulated on the, if they're a right shift, then the toothpaste is accumulated on the back left-hand side. So what we've got to do is move that toothpaste from the left-hand side over to the middle and even slightly off to the right with, with one movement. And then the second movement simply drives it forward. I mean, Mariana, if I said to you, you've got a posterior derangement and extension disorder, is there any problem, any question in your mind what you're going to do with that patient? <laughs> so it's exactly the same for a relevant lateral. You've got somebody with a big yeah. lateral shift. Is there any question in your mind what you're going to do with that patient? Instead of going back to front, You go side to side and then then back to front. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's all. That's there is simple. To it. It's that simple. The the big pointers I would give people when they're looking at relevant lateral shifts is this: a lot of times we try and push people. I remember when I went on the courses. I mean, they told me that people would have autonomic reactions. They'd feel you know they'd feel light. They'd get cold. They'd get dizzy. They'd get nauseous. And one of the things I started doing, rather than pushing them, pushing them, pushing. I just have the patient go exceedingly gently. 
I just want you to bring your hips over to, you know, just start to move, whether, whether we do it side glide, whether we do it in standing freestyle against the wall, however, whatever the correct load for that particular patient is, I'm just saying, take your hips just to the edge of symptoms, okay? And if they already have symptoms, just to where it feels tight, move your hips across, and it may just be a fraction, and they'll say to you, well, I'm not moving very much. And you say, that's fine. Just move to where you can move. Or what you'll notice is, and you'll see it with the patient, is that the, just like with retraction or, or the extension, the point of which they start to stop will occur further and further and further into range. And you're not having this severe pain. You're not having the patient feeling sick. You're not having them get lightheaded. Now, if it's truly, truly a, a very stiff derangement, and what we would call the hard shift, one of the things I found really useful rather than jumping into the shift correction, um, and it may be a little bit of a um, con controversial thing to say is, but, but I start to address, I did a presentation on this in 2019 for faculty and diplomats. What I've started to use is thoracic spine as a medium of reducing the shift. And what I mean by that is, so, you know, if somebody cannot side glide, one of the things I'll do um, is I'll actually have them do seated thoracic rotation. I mean, if you hmm. think about it, take a step back. Have, have you ever had a situation where you've got a patient in the cervical spine who has a relevant, a big relevant lateral component and it's clearly lower cervical spine, but they're unable to tolerate lateral flexion. It's that big a derangement. What do you do? What do you normally do with that patient if it was yours? Take out gravity, lie them down. You could lay down, or what's another thing you can do? Work thoracic, I guess. No, well, you can. Or the other one you can do is you can start with cervical rotation. Okay? Because it's too big to go laterally, so you can start gently. I, I know a lot of the faculty do it because I've spoken to them. You can start gen gently retracting and rotating, right? And as you do that and you clear rotation, well, now you start to be able to side flex. Okay? And so I might be saying to that patient, okay, the, the first session in the cervical spine may just be clear rotation. When you come back tomorrow, we'll start working on lateral flexion. And guess what? In the lumbar spine, on a shift you can't reduce because it's so stiff, start some thoracic rotation really gently. Start to move it just a little bit. All of a sudden, the side glide starts to return. Using that, I mean, honestly, using that, I would say I haven't done a manual. I'm not saying they're not useful and they're not important to know they are, but I have not needed to do a manual shift correction in three years. Oh, that's so interesting. I never thought about that. And it's less stressful on the therapist. It's less stressful. It's certainly less stressful on the patient. Now, is that going to mean, you know, tomorrow morning I'll probably see three patients now that I'll have to manually shift correct. But <laughs> that's from Murphy's Law. But, but honestly, hand on heart in clinic, I, uh, and I've got pictures of some humdinger shifts that reduce beautifully with thoracic rotation. Very interesting. And uh, this weekend that we were in the cars, the, the, the discussion uh, cases, the, this, the, cl the clinical decision making, uh, I remember that was told also about some experiences, some cases improving if you increase the the shift, if you can reduce, it doesn't work, increase a little bit, and then after that, reduce. So I don't know if you had any experience with that situation too. Well, it's interesting, actually, because I was with Mark Miller on the diploma program, and Mark was away, and myself and John, John Miller, Major Miller, um, you might be Lieutenant Colonel Miller now, um, we were doing our diploma together, and we had a couple of guys there who were ipsilateral shifts, and they just weren't responding. And so um, it was like, at that point, uh, I sort of looked at John and said, well, you know, we're going to be sending them out. Let's see what happens if we sh increase the shift. And literally, the, the, uh, on that occasion, we increased the shift. It did, did side glides, you know, exacerbating the shift. The guy did five or six movements and the shift was gone. He just went boom and reduced. That's now, that's crazy. Happened, that's happened to me twice in my career, right? So it's not something <laughs> yeah. that uh, and both of them were there. Um, I, I don't see that regularly. I do see very regularly that, that I can reduce the shift using thoracic rotation either to start it, and sometimes by the time you're done using it, you don't even need the cycle. Yeah. Okay. 
Do you see any difference with leg pain, any dull leg pain to reduce them and doing the rotations? Does it make any difference in your experience? Um, so, I mean, what I would suggest to anyone watching this is, first of all, if you're going to do, if you're going to think of even, even contemplate using something different, go through your normal progression first. Mackenzie said, if there's a lateral shift, use a shift correction. Okay. If they're correcting beautifully, what I try now in my algorithm or what I've been playing with, in my, that sounded so wrong. Please edit that out. <laughs> what, 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 um, in the way that I've been playing around with this to try and understand it more, um, I would say that uh, symptom location can play a role in which one I'd go for first. But what I'm trying to do, and again, this is what I recommend to anyone who's listening to this, try and do your normal progressions first. So you do self-shift correction, try your, your manual shift correction. But before you start going to mobilization and flexion with rotation, then at that point, I, that's where I would go for the thoracic rotation and see what you get. So thoracic rotations followed by, and, and then you can start to add the side glides back in. You know, and sometimes I'll do that. I'll do some thoracic rotation, then some side gliding standing, more thoracic rotation, more side gliding standing. If the patient starts to progress rapidly with the thoracic rotation, uh, then I'll stand them up. If they're, sh if they're no longer shifted, which does happen, I'd say probably in about 20% of the time, then I'll see what the side glide is. If it's clear, then I'll start progressing them into extension. I mean, the, using this, I can normally fix a shift in about 10 to 15 minutes. That's awesome. So you just use the rotation to get started and, and then try to go to extension as soon as you can, once they are reduced. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so in some cases, I'll, need, I'll just use the lateral, the, the mm. side glide. In some cases, I'll use the rotation plus the side glide. In some cases, all I need is the rotation. It really seems to be dependent as well on how effective it is based on symptom location. Now, if it's a traditional sciatica, I may need to do the, and they can't tolerate side glide. I may need to do some of the thoracic rotation to get them moving, but often they're going to require side glide and standing after that. If it's higher lumbar, um, then what I'm finding is, you've got, you know, it'll be the anterior thigh pain, the iliotibial band pain, um, anterior hip, local glute, that stuff seems to respond incredibly well to the thoracic rotation. So rotation seems to be a good movement for like mid to upper lumbar spine. Um, because actually, I don't know what your experience is, but my experience is if I take that person and try and do the mobilization and flexion with rotation, I'm actually opening them up, I think, mechanically on the painful side instead of reducing them. So often, I'll actually, they, they don't do as well with the mobilization and flexion with rotation, but with loaded rotation, they seem to do much, much better. And if you think about it, Robin suggested that a shift should always be reduced in the loaded position. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether I'm side gliding yeah. them to apply a lateral force or I'm rotating them to apply a lateral force, it's still the same thing. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. The, only, the big difference may be the, um, if I'm using thoracic rotation or they require a lot of thoracic rotation, what I'm finding is not only then do I restore lumbar extension, but I also restore thoracic extension. But again, I'm only using that thoracic rotation only if they're not responding to the traditional McKenzie pathway of, you know, self shift correction. You know, we can apply some manual shift, see what happens. They're not responding to that. I'm jumping over to the thoracic rotation. Uh, and I recommend anyone who's even contemplating playing with it, um, go through your normal McKenzie progression first. If you're standing there scratching your head, as you can see, I've done a lot of head scratching over the years, uh, mm -hmm. then you may, then, then if, if it's like, well, I don't know what else to do with you, I'm going to kick you out the door and it's surgery and epidurals, give the thoracic rotation a shot. What have you got to lose, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good alternative. So when you feel like you, you don't know what else to do, another another thing to try and i just want i'm curious to ask you one question i don't know if you have any theory about it this anatomical model of the 
the pain being on the same side or the other side of the the shift is we are just discussing like a paper so that's why I, this weekend we are discussing that paper so i thought about like well just curious if you have any thoughts on that that it looks like the the disc is not really like the the responsible if it's the 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 compression of the nerve root is like inside or outside the nerve root if it changes the the, the side that you're shifting do you have any theory about that yeah a real little theory um uh, because i've been trying to figure out you know where's you know mackenzie in his wisdom said that if you got somebody with an ipsilateral shift you're going to do the regular shift correction and when I went to when I did the courses, the hypothesis obviously with the with, with the disc model, uh, the conceptual disc model, with the contralateral is a fairly obvious causality, or or at least it's a logical causality. You know, you have the patient shifted across, the toothpaste is off to the right side, shoulder drop to the left, pains down the right side, makes sense, right? You correct that, it goes away. But then um, the, the, the model or some of the explanations we were given when we went through the training was, well, and I know some people still give this out, well, when, when, when I'm shifted to the left and the pain is on the left, what's the story there? And somebody's like, well, the disc collapsed on the left, so they're compressing the nerve root. So I, I, I don't know how plausible this is. I honestly don't. It's sort of like one of those thoughts that you have. A, 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 one day all of a sudden I was thinking, I wonder if it's such a big, displacement on the right if i'm a left lateral shift and my pain's on the left if there's such a big displacement on the right could the could the displacement be compressing the neural structures on the left you see what i'm saying because if i'm compressing the segment like that I, 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 and it's you know i just have one of those like hmm, the collapsing the disc doesn't make sense to me but a bloody great big disc bulge on the right side or a, a big mechanical displacement because we don't know it's a disc. And, th and now you've got this model and the pain's on the left because what I'm finding is, is as I'm correcting this, the pain on the left goes away. So is it possible that just the pressure on the left-hand side or, or, on the neural structures, on the foramen, I mean, everything's innovated. It can all give symptoms. Because sometimes it takes a little bit of time to go away, but just like you, you remember with, with one of the indicators we say is it, as long as the symptoms aren't getting worse and the mechanics and function are improving, even in the absence of centralization, you're moving in the right, you know, those are pretty good indicators to say you're in the right direction. So if range of motion's improving, function's improving, but they've still got some pain on the opposite side, what I'm finding is over the 24 hour period afterwards, that pain on the op on the side on the ipsilateral side goes away. I mean, we've had, I've had some, in my clinic, we've had some really good success. Myself and Nick Larea, who's my co-therapist, you know, because we've just seen so many, and I think that's the only reason I can talk about this and feel relatively comfortable is I just see so many. I was seeing, you know, if you think like ten, Mackenzie said, 10% of all lateral shifts are ipsilateral. If we're seeing 20 to 30 uh, uh, new patients, let's say we see 40 new patients a month, 30 of them to 20 of them may be, let, that's, that may be big, 20 of them have probably got a lateral shift. Uh, and, and so we're going to see at least one to two ipsilaterals every month. And when we see those ipsilaterals, they respond. They respond really well. Um, you know, and of course, if they're not responding and they don't respond to anything there uh, and we know there are no red flags and we'll just you use Hans's model of sending them off, getting an epidural, getting them back and seeing do they now become responsive. Uh, but it's taken the fear away from lateral shifts or, or not the fear, but the, the, the stress. I mean, it's like it, it's a nice feeling when someone walks in the door and they're crooked and you like you, you ascertain that, that, you know, that the shift came on with the onset of pain. It's visible. Um, patient can't correct it, you know, the criteria for a lateral shift, and all of a sudden they can correct it. Yeah. And in your experience, do you see more soft shifts or hard shifts? Probably more soft than hard. Uh, but when I do see a hard shift, it's, it's, that doesn't mean it's going to be any more difficult to reduce. Okay, we are just as care of them. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and, and there's nothing to be scared of. I mean, if it's fully extruded, you're never going to reduce it anyway. But again, out of all of the, um, if it's a mechanically unresponsive radiculopathy, sorry, I've got to start using the right terminology. If it's an MUR, um, there's an MUR, it can sometimes become responsive over time. Or again, you go get them an epidural and they become responsive as long as there are no red flags and you've ruled them out correctly. Uh, because they don't all respond on day one. But boy, I tell you, it's amazing how quickly they do respond. Over the next few days, things start to calm down. Very nice. Um, how are you experienced about changing a little bit the angle if you can find uh, success on the lateral, do like a slide flexion or moderate flexion to reduce it? Do you use that too? Yeah, especially with the older kyphotic patients. Actually, the first time I had to do that was on the diploma program. We had a real elderly lady who had a big lateral shift with pain below the knee. And she could not tolerate, and she was already kyphotic just from being a, a little bit older. Um, and she could not re tolerate being brought into the extended position. So we simply stuck her in front of a treatment bed. It was a power bed, lowered the bed till she was in a degree of flexion, had her do side gliding and standing with the bed lowered, then raised the bed up a little bit, do side glides again until she clears the plane then raise it up again and, and then eventually until we brought into a, as neutral a plane as she's ever going to be in. I mean, the thing about lateral shifts is pe people see these things. Uh, I mean, they're, the, the, the longest lateral shift or the, the oldest lateral shift I, I've seen was actually on a part A and there were, must have been 40 witnesses. I was with Greg Silver, who used to be a member of our faculty before he retired. And we saw a guy come in there and he had had that lateral shift for 45 years. His name was Paul. He was like in his Oh early my stuff. goodness. And, uh, you know, the course got really mad at me because I, I'm looking at this guy and, uh, and, and these were the questions I said. I'll never forget this because it's one of those aha moments that you're never going to forget when you see it. And I said to him, how long have you had a lateral? Sh Do you know when this happened in the examination? He said, yep, 45 years ago, I was putting a ca canoe on top of my car. There was a pop. And I've been like this ever since. And I'm like, well, does it hurt? Because, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, when you're on the course, you take a history and you say to everyone, well, what does it look like? Derangement, dysfunction, postural syndrome or other. And everyone's like, it's got to be dysfunction. It's got to be stenosis because he's old. And I said, okay, Paul, does it hurt? And the guy's like, hell yes, it hurts. I'm bent sideways. And we do the movement loss exam. The guy extends and the pain peripheralizes all the way down his leg. We flex him and the pain peripheralizes all the way down his leg. And I'm like, well, what have we got here now? And was like, oh, okay, it looks more like a derangement. 12 hours, the guy was straight. 12 hours, it was reduced. And I mean, he was very happy. And then he became very upset. He was like, you're telling me all I had to do was stand against the wall and do this, you know, side gliding, standing against the wall. And this would have gone away. And I was like, yeah, he goes, well, why didn't someone show me this 45 years ago? You know? I mean, how many times have you had, you're, 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 you're a diploma therapist or you're? Certified, certified. How many times have you ha heard that in, in your year? How long have you been a certified therapist? Uh, since 2016. Yeah, how many times since 2016 have you heard, why didn't somebody show me this before? Yeah, yeah. It's such a simple thing, the rationale that is com more complicated behind it, but like the movements, they just like, oh my gosh, I had one last week that had shoulder pain, neck pain, couldn't lift the arm for months and start doing some neck simple retraction extension and reduced thoracic extension. And she was like, oh my God, I can lift my arm. I've been not able to do that for months and been doing traditional PT. So. <laughs> I mean, I'm seeing it all the time. I'm seeing it in my professional athletes, unable to use their arm, unable to use a leg. You know, there, there, there are so many points, so so many things that are very simple to sort out if you keep it simple. And that's the problem. I think we try as clinicians, we try and make things complicated, and there's no need. It's you know, if you just follow. I mean, look, Mackenzie went through a lot to get us to where we are now. Um, I, I, I honestly believe that because at the end of the day, to do a total hip replacement. The actual mechanics of doing it aren't that difficult, but to a, a, to put the knowledge together to be able to have that simplicity of a procedure yeah. is a yeah. lot of work. Yeah, 
And I'm not going to lie, doing what we do to get to that level of simplicity takes a lot of work. But we have to let go of our old stuff. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. I was just curious to ask you if you use a lot of um, flexion in doing like um, with this tap, your foot on top of this tap and doing flexion. Do you use that to reach? Step standing? Not really. Not often. Not not much. Once or twice. But but it's not very. I, I, it's rare that I get an anterolateral. So yeah. And just an average, how long does it take to correct the lateral and bring them to extension? In your experience, um, I would say the majority of it are extending. I, I see uh, my evaluation is an hour. Mm-hmm. I mean, an, an evaluation for a lateral shift doesn't take very long, does it? I mean, they're crooked. Were you like this yesterday? You, no. Okay. Um, so obviously you go through your basic history, red flags, uh, movement loss exam, baselines, and correct the shift, right? Because it's different to a relevant lateral. That's what people get confused with. Um, it's a very big and blatant relevant lateral. You know, to detect a relevant lateral, you have to go through the sagittal plane to expose it. When somebody walks in and they're bent sideways, and they weren't like that certain, not their typical shape. Well, you've exposed it. You don't, you, you know what to do. Um, so I would say going gently. By the end of the session, I'd say 75 to 80% of the patients are extending. That's very cool. Now, they're still doing, they're, they're still applying lateral force. So they'd be doing side glide and then they follow it with extension. And I tell them, you know, when you get out of the car, you're going to be crooked again, but get against the wall or whatever your technique is, the appropriate technique, and when, you complete, when you've done clear side glide or the frontal plane, you're, you've got to work into extension. And do you feel they need a lot of lateral for like a while or not for too long? I would say not a lot. I mean, normally if they're, if they're compliant, which let's be honest, most shifts are going to be compliant because they're disabled. And if you can prove to them right there and then, you, you can get them in the right direction. I would say, you know, maybe a couple of sessions. There are always going to be outliers, right? There are going to be those that you're doing side glide on. I've got one that we've been side gliding for three weeks. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, and, um, the, uh, 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 and he's finally working into extension. But he had a massive shift. And it was, and um, he was, and so it took a lot of work. But for the most part, I'd say 70 to 80% of the shifts by the first session, or at least by the second session, they're extending. Um, And some of them are reduced within a couple of weeks and we're recovering function and getting them back. And then when you do extension, is always the hip center, or do you go a little bit off center in the corrective direction? Depends on the patient. Um, you know, if I'm doing the manual shift correction, I'm going to go to the, well, if I had to do the manual shift correction, I'd be going to the overcorrect position. I'll try and do it purely in the sagittal plane, but if not, I will have them overcorrect it and go from there. If they keep reducing, because you're going to have that patient who keeps saying, okay, it's coming, I'm extending, you know, I've done my side glides, I'm starting to extend, I know the patient's coming back down the leg. All right, more side glide, try again. That's not happening. Okay, right, hips off center, stay off center, now extend. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, it's gonna be, yeah he's got to read the patient and i'm just curious to ask you something that we talked before that i think was very interesting your experience with the football players that you mentioned before your neck and back we are just talking about thoracic in these new um ways of using thoracic and the importance of thoracic that sometimes we forget about so do you want to talk about that example that you told me before about the, the, the back and neck pain of the, the, the football players? So, so I'm in a bit, yeah, sure. So, so I'm in a bit of a unique situation in that what, what so I've been very lucky. I'm starting to see, uh, for the last two years, I've been seeing pay, patients for the NFL. And these are the guys who are retired through UNC. They asked me if I would be the therapist for the program. I think there are like four centers around the country. And so the guys who are retiring or have retired um, have access to a whole barrage of, uh, of medical help. But what they do is they'll fly these in UNC where I'm working. 
they have it's called the Bay, brain body program and they bring in guys who have had like concussions and all sorts of other ailments or any ailments uh, and they're evaluated by psychotherapists um, neuropsychologists physical th- and, and i do the physical therapy part and so they drop these guys in on us and we've got one hour literally an hour to evaluate them from head to toe um, and so normally the question is you know it's exciting to do because these guys, nearly all of them feel to a certain extent they have a level of disability from playing in the um, league. Um, And of course, before they played in the league, they played at college. And a lot of these guys um, generated injuries in college, but because of the psychology of the sport, they just continued on. And they're such excellent athletes that they could play, th- play, play on with these things. And so a lot of the time, by the time they've come to see, they're coming to see me, they've manifested, they'll have like bilateral shoulder pain, bilateral ankle pain, knee pain, back pain, <laughs> neck pain. But what I'm finding is a huge commonality with all of that is they have mid back pain as well. And I mean, how many, t- uh, let me throw an example out to you. How many times have you seen a patient in the clinic that comes into you and they've got cervical pain and they've got lumbar pain? And the traditional question I would always ask before I started doing it this way was, well, what's bothering you the most? And they say cervical. So I'd start to reduce the cervical spine. And as we started to get better in the cervical spine, I'd start to look at the lumbar spine. And then what I'd find was that the cervical spine would start to get exacerbated again. And so I'd go back to the cervical spine, then the lumbar spine would start to get exacerbated again. And without going into too many details, one day doing this, going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, I had an epiphany. Um, um, and I was like, hold on a minute, stand up. Take, uh, actually, I'll tell you the story really briefly. I mean, it's not, uh, um, basically, I had a guy who had neck and radiculopathy. Treated him, neck and radicular pain got better. He was getting up. And as he was walking out, the guy had a big old lateral shift. And I'd never noticed it before. And I said to him, Mate, does that bother you? And he said, yeah, it bothers me. It's been there for 20 years. Every time I play soccer, you know, the proper football, my leg goes numb. And so I said, well, look, here's a simple exercise. This was before I got into any of the shift correction stuff that we're doing now. Uh, And it's the reason I did get into doing it the way I'm doing it now. Uh, And I said to him, "Uh, well, do this side glide movement and come back and see me in a couple of days. Anyway, the guy phones me an hour, two hours later and says, John, every time I do that side gliding movement, my arm goes numb. And I'm like, well, you're probably not doing it right. Now, the guy's an engineer, and most of the time, engineers are pretty precise, right? So I said, well, come back and see me tomorrow. Let's make sure you're doing the exercises correctly. And I'll do a bit better evaluation on you. I'll do a proper eval. Because, I mean, I basically said, do side glide. I'll see you later. It was the end of the session, and I had another patient waiting. Anyway, comes back the next day. And um, I said to him, okay. Go ahead and do a side glide. He starts doing side glide, goes, arms numb. Because I thought maybe he's throwing his head off at a weird angle. You know, we all come up with all sorts of reasons. And he's doing the, the technique was perfectly good. Starts side gliding, his arm goes numb. I said, okay, let's try something else. I'm going to have you lay down. So I did mobilization and flexion with rotation. So that way I'm figuring he's laying on his back, his torso isn't moving. You know, if there is any kind of strain, I get less than a quarter of the way through range, he goes, arms numb. And I'm like, well, either you're dying or I'm missing something here. So stand up and take your shirt off. He takes his shirt off and he's shifted. And I said, flex. And as he flexes, there's a massive deviation during that movement. And it seems to be occurring in the mid-back. Now, that's highly subjective because we don't know where anything's occurring anywhere in the spine, right? And then as he extends, there's that big deviation again. And it was blatant. Now, I've not seen anything as big as that, but it was big enough to get my attention. So I sat him on the side of the bed and I said, try rotating. And he goes, no problem that way. Can't move that way at all. I feel it all in my ribs. I'm like, okay, start doing repeated rotation. He starts doing repeated rotation, stands up. I said, now side glide again. Now he gets 80% of the way through the range before his arm goes numb. I like lay down, let's do the mobilization inflection. I get to the end of range there before his arm goes numb. Stands up, does the thoracic rotations again. Now he can side glide and um, he can um, 
and do the mobilization and flexion without his arm going numb. And then that's sort of where I came up with the thing. I know Mark has been looking at it. Robert's been looking at it. They're doing more manual stuff, um, but still pushing on the spine and get thoracic spine and getting some surprising results. But on this, I just sort of said, well, how do I explain this? I'm trying to figure out what I'm looking at here. Because you see something and you either ignore it and go on, or you're like, well, what have I looked at? And, you know, being a McKenzie guy and listening to the way McKenzie saw what he saw, I'm like, well, I wonder why that's happening. And then I sort of said, well, you know, if you think of the spine like a bicycle chain, if all the links in the chain are moving normally, great, no problem. You take the middle of the links in the chain and it gets jammed, what happens? The, the chain derails, right? Because the links above and below don't move normally. So I figured all I'm really doing here is wiggling loose the links in the middle. Now the, chain, the links above and below start moving normally. And so going back to your original question before I waffled all over the place, what about, what's happening with these football players? These are 300-pound gladiators that are running, that are incredibly fast. And they're running full speed into another 300-pound gladiator, trying to wipe him out. And their heads or upper backs hit, and they do that really hard to each other. And they do that every single Saturday and every single training session. And they've been doing that since they were six or seven years old. And what's happened is they've jammed the hell out of those links in the middle of their spine, in the middle of the bicycle chain. And because of that, they can't raise their arms. They can't move their legs. I can't show it to you, but I've got video after video after video of these guys uh, who, who, whose function within the hour improves dramatically. I mean, if it comes down to patellofemoral pain that goes away or, or shoulder pain that goes away, and it's all McKenzie. I think if McKenzie would have had another 20 years, he would have got all of this and we would have been learning this from him. And now, of course, it's you know, it's people like Robert and Mark and me and other people who are putzing around with this to try and figure out how we bring it all together. Um, and, and so I'm seeing lots of this stuff, and the, uh, and the, pa- the, the players get really excited about it. You know? Yeah, that's so interesting, finding these connections and testing these different movements and have that type of result. So it's just very interesting and insightful all the the tips and your experience observation that's really cool i hope it helps a lot of other therapists that are helping uh that are listening to the podcast as well so that was really good thank you for sharing that i appreciate it you're welcome you're welcome uh so let's transition to our final questions um before i ask you these final questions do you have anything else that you want to add about the lateral shifts everything that we talked so far I mean, the the only things I would say, and I'll, I'll let you get going because we're both, we're both late here. Um, I would say whether if it's a lateral shift, there should be no question as to what you do. You know, you do McKenzie shift correction, and then if if you're not getting a result, we've spoken about a couple of other things you can do. And the other thing that I think confounds people greatly is a relevant lateral component, right? Uh, because that's not obvious. You don't see it. The patient can come in um, and they can have symptoms in their buttock and down their leg, and they either get. Uh, and as you take them through the eval, it sounds like they're going to have a lateral problem, but they respond beautifully in the sagittal plane. But 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 if they don't respond beautifully in the sagittal plane, then they've got a relevant lateral problem. You know, if they get, uh, uh, you know, over the first over the first three sessions, if they either get dramatically worse with loaded and unloaded sagittal play, well, then you know they're lateral and you know where to go with them. And if they fail to respond, but they have all the criteria of a relevant lateral component, then you're going to end up going lateral. And you go lateral until you can return to the sagittal plane. So essentially, it's a lateral shift without the deformity, but you have to go through the sagittal plane to determine that they're relevant. That's the only other thing I say, because that's one of the questions that always comes up to me on the course, be it a part B, and people, you know, you say, what are you still confused about? And people are confused about lateral shift, relevant lateral components. And lateral shift is clear and blatant. It's a deformity. Relevant lateral is going to be clear because they don't respond or they get worse in the session. Yeah, yeah. Great. So now asking the final ones. What is your favorite resource of information? Anything that you like in particular? Um, my art, using your eyes in front of you, looking at evaluating the patient and listening. Actually, I would say that's the biggest one. The, the biggest source of information for me <laughs> is the patient. You know, yep. 
um, one of the things, one of the shortcomings I think we have as a profession is when we walk into a room, we've determined what we want to do to the patient before we actually bother listening to them. I believe it was Syriax who says, don't judge the patient, listen to them, or some, so, some semblance or something like that. And Maitland said the same thing, and Mackenzie said the same thing, don't be judgmental, listen to the patient, and all the answers will be there with them. So my biggest source of information is the patient. Um, and then my colleagues, you know, um, you know, there are a lot of guys, Rob Medcalf, uh, uh, Richard Rostow, uh, um, you got Josh out there. All these guys are writing nice research. I'm trying to write some more research. Um, all the, all the time, all these fellows are looking at stuff and other clinicians as well. Awesome. And what would be the best advice you can give to clinicians that are starting their careers? Um, be a diagnostician. You've spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy to become a physiotherapist. One of the things that makes me the, the sad part is I would say the majority of our profession, unfortunately, go through all of that and then they simply become a technician. You know, they do whatever they're going to do, regardless of the patient in front of them. And, and the thing is, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I mean, I bet you are. You're a, you're, you're a DPT? I'm not. So I got my license validated from Brazil. So I have a bachelor's degree because of the year I graduated. So. Me too. Me too. But you know, <laughs> the, the thing is, we're, we're calling ourselves a doctoring profession. This is the way I would look at it this way. Look, when you go to the doctor and you've got a medical problem, what does he do? He examines you. Based on the examination, hopefully, he prescribes you a medication or a form of treatment. Then, based on your response to that treatment, he either increases the dose, decreases the dose, or changes the medication. That's how we need to be as mechanical therapists. You come to me, I give you an exercise. Based on your response to that exercise, I increase the dose, I decrease the dose, or I change the medication. You know? That, that, that's how we need to be if we want to move forward and be respected as a profession. Mm -hmm. And what personal qualities and abilities that you feel are important to be a successful PT? You've got to love what you do. I mean, really, I would say my, 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 my previous comment uh, is what makes you a successful PT is care, uh, listen to the patient prescribe appropriately don't be afraid to admit when you cock it up because we will and you do and i do and then turn around and i mean mark said it beautifully mark miller said it beautifully he said look one of three things will happen right you'll get better you'll get worse or nothing the worst thing that can happen is nothing if you get better or worse i know what to do next yeah you know and to keep an open mind and enjoy it because you know what i've been doing this i graduated in 1994 so I've been a physio ever since that. And before that, I was a, I was a medic. So, uh, I, and so I've been treating patients since 1986. I'm really old, okay? And, and I love it. It's so much fun. Um, and going to the clinic every day is fun for me because it's like I'm going to get to analyze new people. I'm going to see athletes. I'm going to see old people. I'm going to see normal people at every day of the thing. And I'm going to try and make their life. I'm going to try and understand their problem and, and, and help them. Uh, and for me, that's fun. That's truly enjoyable. I enjoy doing that. And I love seeing people who are disabled and non-functioning become rapidly functioning. Or if not, be able to determine you don't need to be here. We've got some red flags. We need to get you rapidly to somebody else. Because, you know, when, when you use McKenzie's system pro properly, you'll be able to identify those patients. You may not know what's wrong with them but you'll know they don't belong in your clinic. And to me, that's, that's a huge amount of satisfaction and that's what makes a successful clinician. Absolutely. So John, if people wanna contact you or learn more about you, your work, or have any questions about laterals, how they can find you? They can email me, I'm on the McKenzie website. Uh, if you go to North Carolina, which is where my clinic is, I think I'm the first person on that particular list. Um, so it should have my contact details, but you've got my, my, uh, my email is john, J-O-N-S-P-I-N-E-B-L-O-K-E at gmail.com, johnspineblok at gmail.com. 
feel free to co connect with me. I, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time and you're having this very interesting conversation, insightful, a lot of different ways of seeing things and new things that we can try when you feel stuck. So I really appreciate you, you sharing all of that with us. Oh, man, you're welcome. And look, I apologize for keeping you. Uh, you know, we've been trying to get this together for several months now, so I'm glad it finally worked out. It worked. That all that matters. doesn't matter <laughs> how long it took. We are here. We made it. And I'm really thankful. Oh, well, it's really nice to meet you, Mariana. Keep up the good work. <laughs>